It's a simple question, really. Are you safer with a non-vaccinated police officer answering your 911 call or no police officer at all? And that's when the animation is supposed to roll, but we seem to be having a problem uh, with that. These things happen, so we will press on. Hopefully, we'll have some video along the way. I'm Leland Vitter. Good evening. It's nice of you to be with us. Please bear with us as we move on. Amid the highest murder rate in 25 years, Chicago's mayor thinks its residents are safer with potentially 3,000 fewer police officers, and she is not alone. Today, Washington State Governor Jay Inslee's vaccine mandate goes into effect. Here is Washington State Patrol Officer Robert LeMay's retirement radio call recorded last night. You've kept me safe and got me home to my family every night. Um, thank you for that. Um, wish I could say more, but um, this is it. So State 1034, this is the last time you'll hear me in a state patrol car. And Jay Ansley can kiss me. Thank you for your 22 years of violence and service to the citizens of Washington State. You've taken on many roles in your time as a patrol. In your first year, you delivered a baby. In case you can't figure it out, he quit rather than get the vaccine. Are the people of Washington State safer without Trooper LeMay on the road tonight? That's a question for you to answer. As we speak here in Chicago, officers face questioning on their vaccination status. Those who refuse are taken off the streets if they cannot provide proof of the shot. This is a termination form showing one officer's forced to turn in his gun and badge. It comes from Alderman Raymond Lopez, who will join us in a minute. As discussed, this new mandate, these officers being stripped of their badge, comes as homicides in the city have hit a 25-year high. Just this weekend, four people were killed in shootings, another 20 injured. By comparison, COVID kills roughly eight people in the city of Chicago a day. Right now, here is the Chicago mayor a few hours ago. City employees who fail to report their vaccination status through the portal uh, will be placed on a non-disciplinary, no-pay status, but we're still going to give them one last opportunity to do the right thing. Hmm. Okay. The problem isn't just in Chicago. Whether you live in Massachusetts, Washington State, North Carolina, or Maryland, there are fewer police officers protecting you tonight because of the vaccine mandates. And it's not just police officers. A little later, we're going to talk about how vaccine mandates could cripple America. Thousands of nurses are on strike just in time for the holiday travel rush. Thousands of TSA workers face termination. Nearly 40% of state workers in California could be fired. If you think the DMV is bad, just wait. There are classrooms with students but no teachers in New York because of the mandate. And there was a large protest at Southwest Airlines today over the vaccine mandate. Tonight, it's Chicago and cops. Tomorrow, it could be your hometown. Alderman, Alderman Raymond Lopez with us in just a minute, but we start with News Nation's Kelly Besson at Chicago Police Headquarters. Kelly, good evening. Good evening, Leland. Well, officers who have not complied with the city's vaccination mandate that required reporting are given another chance today to comply. They, and if they don't, they will be stripped of their police power. That's the word to clarify. That requirement, again, is to report vaccination status. Now, recently, a memo went out to Chicago police alerting them that they may be fired if they do not comply with the city's vaccination policy. The police union president has been outspoken against this mandated reporting. He says it violates collective bargaining rights. Now, the mayor has been very outspoken as well. Here's what they both had to say today. I really hope that the men and women of the Chicago Police Department, who have been fed a lot of stuff, that's the most polite and appropriate word I can use um, in this forum, are not going to ruin their careers over going to a website and saying yes or no. Now, 60 officers are expected to be processed here today. It's unclear how many of those officers will continue to not comply. Leland? Uh, 60 out of about 3,200, we understand. Uh, Kelly Beeson, thank you very much. Great reporting. Let us know what you see there at CPD headquarters. All right. 
Thank you. Police nationwide risked their lives during the start of the pandemic. They served day in and day out on the streets before the vaccine received approval. Data shows COVID was the number one cause of death among police in 2020. Raymond Lopez, city of Chicago, Alderman, joining us now. Uh, Mr. Alderman, appreciate it. Uh, you tweeted out that form. As we understand it, there are officers today who are not on the street who should be because they don't have the vaccine. Is that a fair characterization? That is a perfect characterization, Lee Lynn, of what's been going on in the city of Chicago. Right now, officers have been called down to police headquarters to be ordered not once but twice to come into compliance or face losing their shield and weapon. And at a time, as you said perfectly, are we safe? No, we're not. We had shootings in my ward yesterday at 4.30 in the morning, gangbangers running around with an AK-47. We have police districts that are already short-staffed because of some of the failed policies implemented by our mayor and her superintendent, David Brown. And to make it even easier to remove officers now from their duties of protecting the residents of Chicago at a time when they need those officers the most is outrageous. It mm. is dumb and it is dangerous. The mayor makes the point that when someone calls 911 and a police officer comes, they should have confidence that that police officer doesn't have COVID. Are you saying that's not a reasonable position or just not one that outweighs having a police officer come at all? Look, it is a reasonable position. And I, for one, believe that our employees should be vaccinated. Let me just say that. But I don't think that you could shove the vaccination down their throats when they have contracts, when there are labor negotiations to be had. That is something that the mayor could have done for the last several months, ever since the first vaccine became available. She chose not to. She chose to pick an arbitrary date to draw a line in the sand and then to target specifically our law enforcement officers when there are 35 other departments in part of our bureaucracy that also need to come into compliance. Yeah, it's not interesting. Threatening any of them. Yeah, it's interesting you bring it up. This is the city vaccination rates. Uh, ben Bradley over at our sister station, WGN, pointed out this graphic, and it's telling. All city employees, 79% vaccinated. Chicago Fire, 72% vaccinated. Chicago Police Department, 64% vaccinated. Should she go after the cops because that's the easiest one to get into a fight to, with? I think that is exactly the case. And you know, despite not two months ago saying that Chicagoans need to tone down the rhetoric with our officers, that we need to be less divisive, less toxic, to be more empathetic of each other following the murder of Officer Ella French, look how far she's turned in two months, demonizing them once again, calling them insurrectionists in Chicago yeah. because they don't believe in her mandate. I, I, I couldn't help but sort of, I don't want to say laugh, but it was sort of, I don't know, embarrassing to say that you call police officers insurrectionists, it's an insult to insurrectionists because that's not the definition of insurrection. Now, these officers are doing what many of our other unions are doing. They're trying to negotiate how to get vaccinated, what requirements are needed to be met through their labor lawyers and through the city's labor lawyers. Lori Lightfoot, on the other hand, has sought to inject herself, her personality, and her vindictiveness at every turn, specifically targeting police, sp specifically targeting them as saying they're tarnishing their badge, when in reality, all they're doing is exercising their constitutional right to collectively bargain and ask for their rights to be respected as well. Yeah, there's a gag order on the Fraternal Order of Police, although one of their union members spoke out. Uh, this is sort of an interesting juxtaposition, though, because you have Mayor Lightfoot lecturing everybody uh, today and demanding compliance. Another order that she has given is the mask mandate throughout the city of Chicago. This is a picture of her from last night uh, celebrating at a basketball game. As you can see, everybody around her is wearing masks uh, but her. I'm wondering, as you're talking to some of the police officers who were forced to turn in their gun and badge, what they think of this? Well, many in Chicago, not just our officers, are really sick and tired of the rules for thee but not for me mentality of not only Mayor Lightfoot, but politicians across this country. If this is impacting all of us, if, if this is something we need to have an all hands on deck approach to, then it should apply to everybody, yeah. politicians being no exception. All right. Uh, Alderman, I really appreciate your time, and I know the officers who you're fighting for appreciate it as well. Uh, as this goes on, keep us updated, all right? Well, God bless our officers. We yeah. had one shot today. Hopefully, he will recover quickly. Yeah, well, we echo those prayers and echo uh, our thanks to them for their service, uh, for sure. Good to see you, sir.
Thank you, Leland. All right. Moment of personal privilege. I have a unique perspective on this next story. It's about nurses. They do not get the respect they deserve. Working under extraordinary pressures, they're paid a fraction of what they should be. They care for their patients in ways the patient's own family members could not. Simply put, if you looked up selflessness in the dictionary, there would be a picture of a nurse. I learned that during my hospital stay with COVID. Rightly hailed as heroes during the pandemic, nurses face termination now because of vaccine mandates. We've heard about that and reported on it. Thousands more striking across the country over working conditions. Some of those strikes and firings have happened in California, North Carolina, Houston, Delaware, just to name a few. Joining us now to discuss world's best-selling author, yes, best-selling author in history, James Patterson, who needs no introduction, is co-author Matt Eversman. All right, so here is the book, ER Nurses, a nonfiction look at those selfless heroes. Gentlemen, appreciate uh, you being with us. Uh, James, start with you. Most surprising thing you learned in this reporting? So I'm not sure yeah. if Mr. Patterson can hear us. Uh, Matt, if you're able to hear us, most surprising thing you learned in this reporting? Yeah. Well, you just said, God bless the, God bless the officers and God bless the nurses. Okay, I guess that's what I did say. Uh, Mr. Patterson, I don't think you, you can hear me. Matt, I'm not sure if you can hear oh, no. me uh, as well. <laughs> These things happen sometimes. We just get gremlins in the show. Uh, gentlemen, stand by. We're going to work you know, on the audio There's problems. so many things that you learn talking to these girls and guys that are, are in those ERs every day. And I think the, the most uh, amazing thing about it is just how committed they are. You know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, they're delivering every single moment. And that is just nothing short of heroic. And, you know, Leland, I write, obviously, a lot of stories, Alice Cross and the Women's Murder Club. The stories in this book are the best I've ever been involved with, and it's their stories. These are the nurses' stories. And every nurse that's read this, and at this point it's thousands of nurses, said that, that Matt and, 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 and you, James, you nailed it. You nailed what we're all about. What, if in your reporting, and I'm not sure if we've got this delay issue figured out, but is there something in your reporting that was a common thread among all the nurses you talked to? I don't know what's going on here. We don't know what's going on here either. So we're going to say goodbye, gentlemen. Stand by. Uh, we're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, more on nurses and also the cartel opening fire over the border at National Guardsmen, how agents at the border are responding as the crisis continues. We'll be right back. Welcome back. They're negotiating in Washington over President Biden's enormous $3.5 trillion spending bill. A good friend of mine said today that, well, Republicans want to spend a barrel of money, Democrats want to spend a few barrels, and then progressives want to spend a 55-gallon drum of money. But Manchin is now feeling the pressure. Of course, he is the senator from West Virginia who threw a wrench in Democrats' plans to be able to push all of this through the Senate, this huge spending bill without any Republicans. And now both sides are taking shots at Joe Manchin in West Virginia. America elected Biden, but got Bernie instead. Tell Joe Manchin, don't give in to this liberal madness. Washington Democrats are out of control with a crisis at our border. When the fight gets tough, Joe Manchin has always stood his ground. First as governor, now as senator, Joe's always pushed back against tax and spend liberals. Now they're at it again, jacking up tax. All right, with that, Chris Dyerwald, author, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, longtime reporter in West Virginia and Washington as well. Chris, uh, you think Joe Manchin loves this or hates this? Uh, I think he loves it. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny, the the attacks on Manchin from uh, conservative pressure groups or right pressure groups uh, are potentially effective. But I got to laugh. Uh, Bernie Sanders writing an op-ed in the Charleston Gazette Mail 
uh, and the and the progressive groups running ads in West Virginia, Joe Manchin couldn't ask for more. That's the best thing that possible. If you are the only statewide elected Democrat in the state and likely to be the only statewide elected Democrat for quite a while, uh, if you are that guy in a state that Donald Trump carried by more than 30 points, one of the reddest states in the union, having progressive Democrats and liberals saying that you're just a mean old man and you're the worst, 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 that's the best pub possible. They just it couldn't be better. So we had you on in September where we were coming up against the September 27th deadline. And you used to tell me in our office chats, never get bet against Nancy Pelosi. Turns out the bet was right that to bet against her and that she didn't get done up on uh, Capitol Hill what she promised she was going to get done. Now we've got this October 31st deadline. Do we bet for or against Nancy Pelosi getting this done? Well, look, the, the question is, how many, uh, how many camels can you pass through the eye of this needle? Uh, you can, uh, the, the first thing they have to do is they have to raise the debt limit. And they also are going to have to raise, uh, and this all comes, comes due uh, before your Christmas shopping has to be done. Uh, all, of this, all of this has to happen, and they've got to uh, come up with a new spending package. So that's the part that has to happen. Then the what they want to happen and the bipartisan $1.2 trillion infrastructure spending package is very, very, very popular with both Republicans and Democrats who are running for re-election. And next year is an election year and they're all thinking about that and they want that passed. The question is, will the progressive caucus, will the Congressional Pro Progressive Caucus be willing to play the Freedom Caucus here and scuttle the whole deal, right. including the stuff that most people want in order to get, try to get a higher number uh, on their social welfare spending package. You know, it's interesting. The other thing in place that the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill, the $1.2 trillion bill you talked about, is extremely popular, uh, is in Virginia with Terry McAuliffe, the guy who's running for governor, not next year in the midterms, but in this year. November 2nd is the election. Uh, right now, Real Clear Politics average, McAuliffe is up by 2.2%. So, uh, jump ball at this point. Uh, Youngkin appears to have some of the momentum here. But McAuliffe is even complaining about Democrats and saying if they can't get something done uh, in Congress, I've got a lot of questions to answer for on Election Day. Well, you'd still have to say McAuliffe was favored in the race. Uh, he's He is running basically as the incumbent. Virginia has only one term for its governors. Uh, but he was a, he's a obviously very well known in the Commonwealth and, and popular. Uh, Biden is dragging him down to a certain degree. The Democrat, national Democrats are dragging him down. Frustration with this stuff. I cannot tell you if all of this goes akimbo and the Democrats lose the thread and they don't pass any of it, right? This is a real death now, not a death now. This is a this is a pain. This is a source of pain for Terry McAuliffe because what he wants to say is, I'm a Biden kind of Democrat. I'm a sensible, moderate. I want to get stuff done. I want to work with the Republicans across the aisle, which McAuliffe can point to successes he had in Virginia. But if the National Party blows up that narrative, uh, basically on the eve of the election, that would not be very helpful for him. It would appear as though the other thing that would not be very helpful for the other guy, this is for uh, Youngkin, for Glenn Youngkin, uh, would be Donald Trump showing up. And we know yeah. that because we can listen to Mr. Youngkin uh, try to answer a pretty simple question uh, without actually answering it. Take a listen. You want Trump to come campaign for you. So I've been really clear all along. I'm campaigning down the stretch in Virginia so you, because guess what? This is about Virginians. This is about Virginians. You know, my opponent, his so yes opinion, no. he's losing. So my yes opponent or no. knows you, he's you losing. You want Trump to come campaign for you. I'm campaigning down the stretch myself. It's this yes is or what's no. Happening. It's a yes or no. I've answered your question three times now. Okay, so what, do, what do you say to the stretch? What do you you know, last time you were on, you coined the term weasel wording. That's not even... mine. That's a, that's a time-honored newsroom phrase for when you're writing a sentence that you know uh, you, where you've got to beat the rap. That's that, Trust me. Oh, okay, so is this weasel wording or is Youngkin telling us everything without saying it? Well, look, you can tell when his voice went up about four octaves there for a second that he doesn't really, he's not very comfortable talking about this. Uh, I certainly understand why he's not because uh, he's, it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you say you don't want Trump to come campaign, which he doesn't, uh, then you're going to upset uh, the people in Western Virginia and 
uh, the populists who are, are fired up for Trump, that will diminish their enthusiasm for voting for you. But of course, if you were to say that you did want him to come, that'll kill you in the Northern Virginia suburbs, that'll hurt you uh, in Richmond suburbs, and it will also hurt you. Uh, Terry McAuliffe wants uh, lots of voters in Virginia, black voters, working class voters, the, the Democratic base. He wants them to see Donald Trump uh, when they look at uh, Glenn Youngkin, and that's what he needs to motivate them with. How much do we look at this race as a bellwether for the 2022 midterms? Well, in nine of the past 11 uh, Virginia gubernatorial elections, the results were predictive of what, uh, of the, of the direction of the coming midterms. So there's a high, high correlation between these two things. Uh, we've known it for a long time, but it's especially useful because Virginia now looks a lot like, uh, what America does on the whole in terms of how diverse, how affluent, how educated, uh, and the divisions within the state between very populous Republicans and a bunch of squishy suburban Republicans and all of that stuff. It's got all the dynamics. So uh, number one, I would expect it to be uh, representative of the direction the electorate's going. If Democrat voters are, uh, are turned, if the volume is down on them and they're not feeling fired up, which is right now the problem Democrats are having, that's something that we would expect carries over into midterms. Uh, but if Republicans are divided or angry at each other uh, over all of this Trump gobbledygook, then, they, then that, that's something we would expect would carry over. So we'll be panning uh, like prospectors looking for those little flakes of gold in the results. Next two weeks, what do we watch for? Two weeks from tonight, we'll be in Virginia uh, covering this. Two we in two weeks, what would change the race dramatically either way? Well, I mean, what you if if there is some sort of breakthrough in Washington, or it seems like happy days are here again for national Democrats, that would be a a, a, a boost from McAuliffe. Uh, the other thing that you would wait that you would look for is if it goes the wrong way and everything looks like a disaster and we're back to the brink. If you're Yunkin, you say, "I'm the kind of outsider. I'm the business guy. I'm not the establishment guy. Uh, th this is what we need in Richmond. Not not more of the same." All right, fair enough, Chris Steyerwalt. Excellent analysis as always, sir. And um, weasel wording, uh, my mother gives, it to, gives you credit for that. So there you go. Good to see you, my I'll friend. Take it. All right. You bet. Short us on furniture, fine. Cars get more expensive, okay. But there's another shortage coming that we're far from fine with. We'll tell you how the empty shelves crisis is perhaps going too far. First, an armed smuggler threatens a reporter at the border. That reporter joining us next. This area right here is a very, very high violent area on the uh, Mexico side. A lot of cartel infighting, report after report every night of machine gun fire. There's a lot of cartel overlap here, and that's the reason why they're fighting. A lot of cartel overlap, and they overlap here because of how valuable this ground is for smuggling. Absolutely. That was from our coverage at the southern border in Texas just three weeks ago. The location you saw right there was a checkpoint that the National Guard calls Purple House, because there's a purple house next to it, but it also gives a great view of the Rio Grande, and that's where the National Guard has one of their main observation points. In the past week or so, there have been three incidents of shots being fired across the border from Mexico at either the National Guard or Texas Department of Public Safety agents. It's becoming now a common occurrence. Just a couple of days ago, the Department of Public Safety in Texas sent us this video after shots were fired by Mexican cartels. You can see the cartel gunmen there uh, with heavy weapons, uh, satellite phones, and body armor uh, as well. The cartels are getting a lot more dangerous. Just check out this video from Yuma, Arizona. An armed smuggler with his hand on his gun threatened daily reporter, daily caller reporter, Jorge Ventura. Ventura had just captured video of the smuggler being paid by a migrant. The smuggler ordered Ventura to put his phone on the ground. Orhe joins us now. Uh, Orhe, you've been down on the border a lot for years covering this. Where does the cartel's newfound chutzpah come from? 
Well, uh, Leland, they're getting more brazen and they're just not, they're not afraid of any type of enforcement uh, at all. And these huge migrant influx just gives them more an ability to uh, essentially overwhelm border patrol at different sectors at, at the border. And they're making more money than ever. We're speaking to border patrol who tells us they're making up to $14 million a day just off human smuggling. And in that area that I was in, uh, Leland right there at, at the gap and in the, uh, the Arizona Yuma sector, I mean, human smugglers, uh, they smuggle, uh, migrants in there day and night and they do it wide in the open and they, they take the cash payments uh, really wide in the open with no type of enforcement they're just brazen uh, with this and that's what I, that I think caught me with the element of of surprise last week is when we were filming this human smuggler being paid uh, by a single male who Border Patrol tells us that that male was most likely bringing drugs mm -hmm. or is a cartel member and you know you saw that in that video where as soon as the smuggler saw me he put his hand on his gun and started to threaten me he then asked me to put my phone down when I stopped recording and to be honest Leland, that was probably the, the most fearful moment of my reporting career um, I just knew that I wasn't gonna give the human smuggler my phone so you know I just made a run to the border wall and took my chances but those are the type of things that are happening day and night on our southern border yeah and those, those are the kind of people not only you but law enforcement is facing uh, give us the sequence of events were you on the Mexico side or the US side of the border have you ever seen encountered the smugglers and the coyotes with guns before? So, Leland, this was my first time encountering a human smuggler that was armed. Uh, we've been in that area before reporting, and the usual, usually what we see is the human smugglers walk up right in the middle of that Colorado River. So right, right in the middle of that Colorado River is the basically the boundary between Mexico and the U.S. And what they'll do is they'll walk up to the boundary, they'll accept their payment from the migrants, and they'll give them the final directions. That was the first time we've ever uh, encountered an armed human smuggler, uh, and it happened in broad daylight. This happened around 7 in the, in the morning. Um, as soon as uh, that happened and you know like my mind went, in, went into complete shock just because that's never happened to me before and he started threatening me he told me to put my phone on the ground uh, you know we made a made a run for it and got out of that area and then border patrol spoke to us a couple hours later and said that the Yuma sector border patrol had a briefing on that encounter and that they would be heavily investigating that area we haven't had any reports of any uh, arrests made wow. but what we're seeing Leland, is that these human smugglers are getting more brazen they're doing it wide, wide yeah. in the open um, in all hours in that Yuma sector yeah or I only got about 30 seconds um, if they're getting this brazen now, firing at the National Guard, wearing weapons uh, as they cross over and pointing and, you know, grabbing them as you walked up, you've been in a lot of places and done some very brave reporting. What's Border Patrol and the Texas Rangers and the like scared of next? What are they worried about going forward? Well, now they're worried about that the, these human smugglers um, will continue to start now smuggling migrants in the open, but armed. And their biggest worry is that if they're now going to be uh, approached with any type of fire. So now we're going to see Border Patrol, especially in that Yuma sector, actually uh, be armed. That's not something that we always see. And that they're afraid that those uh, these human smugglers and these cartels are getting more brazen and will start to shoot hmm. at the Border Patrol and that, that, that Yuma Police Department down there. Yeah, when we were out with the Texas Department of Public Safety on their boats, they had... Uh, heavy machine guns mounted to the side of the boats and people ready to use them. And obviously the intel is now uh, proving true. Or, hey, we're glad you're all right. Keep up the brave reporting, my friend. Thank you, Leland. All right. Well, somebody else is showing their teeth, not only the cartels, but China. And this reportedly caught U.S. intelligence off guard. The Financial Times put out this story. China tests new space capability with hypersonic missile in August. That's the Financial Times reporting. Hypersonic missiles are all but impossible to intercept. And the report is, is that the rocket that you see there went up, launched the hypersonic missile, it flew all the way around the world and then hit a target after it came around the world. So imagine the technology there. China, though, denies this. They say it was a spacecraft. An arms control official is saying the United States is very concerned about Beijing's development of this technology. Probably we should be. Lee Hudson's Politico's defense technology and influence reporter joining us now. Uh, Lee, scary that China has this, terrifying that U.S. intelligence didn't know about it. Are we to believe that really the United States was totally caught off guard by this? Yes and no. Actually, uh, last month, the Air Force Secretary, Frank Kendall, uh, spoke in a public forum saying that he was certain that China may field this type of weapon. 
Um, I just don't know if they knew when the test was taking place. Hmm. Um, and then the head of U.S. Strategic Command, Admiral Charles Richard, he said today that China's nuclear capability is advancing quickly. Uh, and I quote, I'm not surprised at reports like this. I won't be surprised when another report comes next month. Okay, well, so they're foreshadowing something. Obviously, these guys know a lot more uh, than they're willing to talk about. You talked about nuclear arsenal uh, of the Chinese increasing. We've reported a lot on that uh, here. I know you have as well. The new missile fields out in western China, hundreds of new missile silos. This is the tweet from Chinese state media. China has no intention to engage in a nuclear arms race, but it will certainly improve quality of its nuclear deterrence to ensure that the U.S. abandons the idea of nuclear blackmail against China or using nuclear forces to fill the gap as U.S. conventional forces cannot crush China. As you've reported on the Chinese advancements, what makes this hypersonic technology different than all of the other weapons that the Chinese have? Yeah, so what's important about this weapon, um, by using the method that they use to fire the missile, uh, the weapon no longer has a range limit, meaning it can just continue circling around the earth. And that means that their target is unclear so even if the United States or um, another nation could come up with a way to intercept that missile, they wouldn't really know where it was going. And so it makes it really confusing for other nations. Yeah, that's fairly scary, confusing and scary. Uh, Secretary Austin said this, take a listen. You've heard me say a number of times that uh, China is my facing challenge and we're gonna remain focused on that. Cover these things extensively so you can convert the diplomatic defense talk to real people talk. My pacing t challenge means what? They're our top threat, our top adversary. All right, got it. Hey, Lee, awesome reporting. Uh, we read it often in Politico, and we appreciate you joining us, all right? Thanks. Awesome reporting coming up at the top of the hour from Dan Abrams Live. Hey, Dan. Hey there, Leland. So we got a couple of interesting stories I think you'd be fascinated by. I don't know if you guys are touching on the Jon Stewart story. He went on CNN uh, railing against the media for a while. What's interesting about that is many of the things that he railed about, he does. <laughs> so we're going to be we're going to be playing some clips of Jon Stewart and then, of course, Jon Stewart and comparing what he is suggesting the media ought to do with what he does. And then a story that I didn't know had happened. We just saw this late this afternoon. There was a guy who was detained in connection with the search for Brian Laundry. Turns out the guy looks so much like Brian Laundry that all these tips came in. The marshals break down the guy's door, hold him at gunpoint until they figure out he's not <laughs> Brian Laundry. He gets a free breakfast from his hotel uh. Uh, in exchange for that. So um, a couple of interesting stories there. We got some other uh, stuff coming up as well. Ho hopefully, um, hopefully there was waffles. Eight. Maybe for the breakfast. I don't know. It, Waffles it, it and was the eggs. breakfast. And I said that he should be able to get a to go as well. You know, they don't <laughs> yeah. like you to do that at the breakfast. Yeah, you buffet. definitely need to go. You got to eat it there. Yeah. But I said it for this guy, he ought to be able to get the uh, the wrap on top, be able to take unlimited home with him. Yeah, I couldn't couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I'm going to give you a tease though. You own a winery, right? I do. Yeah, you do. All right. Pay pay attention to the last block of our show. You're going to want to you're going to want to see this. All right. I will. All right. I will. There we go. I look forward to it. All right, Dan. Talk to you soon. See you later. When we come back, remembering Colin Powell, the last of a great generation. Our future lies in the philosophy of love and understanding and caring and building not of hating and tearing down. We know that, each and every one of us know that to the depth of our heart, and we must be prepared to stand up for it and speak up for it. We must not be silent if we would live up to the legacy of those who have gone before us. Words of wisdom there from maybe the last person hailed as a great American by all. Former Secretary of State, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Colin Powell. General Powell passed away this morning, Secretary Powell, at 84 years old. With that, we bring in 
Mac McClarty, former White House Chief of Staff for President Clinton, and Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, former U.S. Army Delta Force member and also Under Secretary of State. Gentlemen, appreciate you both being with us. Obviously, wish it was under uh, different circumstances. General Boykin, uh, first to you. What were the qualities about then General Powell and his leadership that allowed him and helped him transcend to be Secretary Powell? Yeah, first of all, he was an exceptionally bright man. Uh, and uh, it, it didn't take you long to, to figure that out, but he didn't flaunt that. He, he, uh, he was a very wise man. He also was a man who uh, did not suffer spools uh, very easily. And, and if you had uh, your stuff together when you went in to brief him or to uh, participate in a meeting with him, uh, you would fare okay, but if you didn't, uh, he would let you know fairly quickly that uh, you uh, needed to go back and do your homework. And uh, unfortunately, I uh, I went through that on one occasion, but never <laughs> never again. again. That's pretty good. I like that, uh, Mr. McLarty. I'm I'm fascinated by something that was so unique about Colin Powell as he was revered by men on both sides of the aisle. And I'm wondering what it was like for that transition between being chairman of the Joint Chiefs under George H.W. Bush, and then you all came in from Arkansas, a very different administration, and how uh, then General Powell navigated that. You're exactly right, Leland. There's no question uh, Colin Powell was a patriot, uh, a statesman, and a diplomat, and, and much, much more. Uh, General Boykin, I thought, captured him quite well. You're right, it was a real act of diplomacy and political skill to navigate from the Bush 41 administration where General Powell had been such an integral part of that administration, including Desert Storm, to a Democratic administration and President Bill Clinton. He, he always offered such good counsel, had engagement, and of course we had tremendous respect for him, but what he earned with us and I hope and believe we earn with him, was a level of trust. Now, he certainly seemed to then bring that forward, and I think, I think he spoke about the level of trust he then had uh, with your administration. Uh, General Boykin, give us that story, because everybody now is talking in my ear how interested they were the one time that you went crossways with not being so squared away and what you had. Well, I, uh, I gave him some information uh, during the... Uh, run up to the first Gulf War. I gave him some information that was incomplete. And uh, I did not realize uh, that uh, he knew a whole lot more than I anticipated. And he already knew the answer as I gave him, uh, I gave him my answers or my conclusions or my assessment. And uh, he let me know very quickly that if I was going to sit in his briefings and have a role in his briefings, and I'd better know what the truth is uh, the next time I come into one of these meetings. Uh, Let me assure you, Leland, that I went overtime in yeah. preparing for every briefing after that. Well, and I guess, uh, Mr. McClarty, you were on the other side of a lot of the briefings from General Powell. How unusual is it to have a man, and you pointed it out, general, combat leader, statesman, and also diplomat, and then tie it all together with, and you used an interesting word, calling a general a politician. Well, he did have political skills. There's no question about that. He had many other skills, including a great sense of caring, as I'm sure the general knows, for his troops. He had such an engagement with the people that he led. That was one of the real secrets, if you will, or characteristics of his leadership. But leading the first encounter we had with General Powell was before President Clinton was inaugurated, the night before the inaugural, the passing of the football as chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, Colin Powell gave us that briefing at Blair House. It was President Clinton, Vice President Gore, Tony Lake, and Sandy Berger from the National Security Council, and myself. And that's where the relationship began. Wow. And, and you know, just had enormous respect. That was a moment, and what it underscored what an underscore, and the general, of course, appreciates this because he has been so uh, dedicated in his service to our country. It underscored, long before 9-11, the most sacred responsibility of any president, any commander in chief, is the security of the American people. Now, you've, you've talked about that moment before with me. I'm glad you shared it 
uh, here. Uh, Mac McClarty, General Boykin, gentlemen, appreciate both of your time uh, to remember somebody who clearly y'all had so much respect for. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll be right back. The empty shelves crisis may soon be turning into an empty bottle crisis. Wine bottles, that is, because the supply chain issue is affecting the wine industry. So having difficulty getting the glass needed to bottle their wines. Joining us now, someone's dealing with this problem firsthand, Mike Eaton of the Jackson Family Winery, Senior Vice President, Head of Procurement, ninth largest winemaking organization in America. Mike, appreciate it. Uh, is this a, a problem or a crisis for you guys? It's a problem. I wouldn't say it's crisis mode. I mean, we've we've been dealing with challenges in our industry the last uh, several years. Anybody who's paid attention, uh, we've had about five years of wildfires and uh, drought uh, and labor issues as well. I think what what's kind of come to a head in the past uh, six to eight months is the labor has has started to impact our suppliers and the uh, logistics providers. So what you're starting to see is. You know, we we've been able to accommodate things at the producer level, but our suppliers are getting caught by it. And so it's it's uh, it's starting to catch up to, I think, everybody. All right. So uh, I pitched this story to one of our executives. He says, all right. He says, does that mean that eventually there's going to be some good juice in box wine? <laughs> that, well, the, the, it would actually be the other way around, to honest. Uh, when, when we're in a surplus, you get a lot of good juice in boxed wine. When we're in a supply shortage, uh, then, then the boxed wine gets the, has to scrape the bottom of the barrel, uh, literally. Interesting. So, uh, that's not going to help you out there on the well, box I mean, wine. Well, I mean, I guess if there's a shortage of glass bottles, there's a shortage of everything. What, what are you, what's a bigger issue for you guys? Because we keep hearing about the farm labor and picking labor and all that, that that crisis and then also this supply chain crisis is is one affecting you all more than the other well farm labor has been an issue for anybody dealing with agriculture for for decades it's not new it just gets worse every year uh, the good thing is is we're able to uh, mechanize where we can to overcome that uh, the short-term logistics and truck driver shortage that's impacting everybody uh, that's more acute in the in fact that it hits everybody. We're all using the same trucks to push our product from California out to the East Coast. And if our wholesalers and distributor partners don't have enough inventory, they get they might get caught and not have uh, the bottles there on time. We have plenty of wine in our cellar, uh, and it's just a matter of increasing the rigor in our planning process to make sure that nobody's out of stock of Kendall Jackson or LaCrema wines. Uh, all right. Well, we don't want out of stock of any type of wine. Of course uh, not. But, <laughs> but I, think about, I think about you guys, ninth largest in America, Kendall Jackson, La Crema, huge, huge names. For your friends out there in the Valley who can't buy in bulk in the way you do, can't have futures contracts, I feel like this is really going to hurt the little guys the most. Is that fair? It it's exactly right. It always hurts the little guys the most. It hurts the small family farmers. It hurts the small winery wine producers who maybe don't have uh, the inventory, don't have the cash to be able to afford the inventory, or don't have the leverage with the suppliers to make sure that they're getting their, their uh, packaging materials when they need them. So yeah, unfortunately, it always does tend to hurt the small guys first. Yeah, that's what we keep hearing. Uh, regardless, of the industry, but it's a lot more fine, fun to talk about wine. Uh, Mike, great conversation. Thank you. Uh, I think the control yeah. room's now thirsty looking at this shot and everything uh, behind <laughs> you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Leyland. All right. Another Thank great you. winemaker coming up uh, in just a couple of seconds. Dan Abrams for Dan Abrams Live. He's going to tell you about the guy who they thought looked like Brian Laundry. So much like him, they knocked down his door. That's next. We'll see you tomorrow night.